So welcome everyone to our video about the cerebellum. Today we're going to discuss the most important high yield clinical points about the cerebellum. So let's get started. Cerebellum in Latin means the little brain. So the cerebrum is like the big brain and the cerebellum is the little brain. It's located in the hindbrain or rhombencephalon. Rhombencephalon is an embryologic term. The fourth ventricle lies at the base of the cerebellum. This is how the brain is divided during embryology. The first part is called the forebrain or prosencephalon. The second part is called the midbrain or mesencephalon. And the third part is called the hindbrain or rhombencephalon because it looks like a rhomboid shape. And this is just a sagittal section to show that the fourth ventricle lies at the floor of the cerebellum. This may also imply that lesions of the cerebellum may obstruct the cerebrospinal fluid outflow at the level of the fourth ventricle and cause hydrocephalus. The cerebellum is responsible for coordinating voluntary movements. It controls the ipsilateral side of the body because it's connected with the contralateral cerebral cortex. It also contributes to balance and posture. It communicates with the cerebral cortex, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. It consists of the cerebellar cortex and the white matter underneath the cerebellar cortex. And there is also four deep cerebellar nuclei embedded within the white matter. We're going to talk about it in a minute. The cerebellum is divided into three lobes, the anterior lobe, the posterior lobe, and the flocculonodular lobe. A more important classification or division of the cerebellum is the functional division of the cerebellum, because this determines the function of the part of the cerebellum. So the functional divisions of the cerebellum consists of the cerebrocerebellum, the spinocerebellum, and the vestibulocerebellum. The cerebellum also has three peduncles. We have the superior peduncle, the middle peduncle, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. This is an image that shows the anatomical divisions of the cerebellum. We have the anterior lobe, and we have the posterior lobe, and they are separated from each other by the primary fissure. And also we have the flocculus and the nodulus unite together and form the flocculonodular lobe. At the midline of the cerebellum, there is what's called the vermis. And on either side of the vermis, we have the cerebellar hemispheres. So we have right and left cerebellar hemispheres. Here's an image that shows the more clinically important functional divisions of the cerebellum. We have three functional divisions of the cerebellum. The cerebellar hemispheres on each side makes what's called the cerebrocerebellum. The vermis on the midline and the area next to the vermis called the paravermis makes the spinocerebellum. And finally, the flocculonodular lobe is called the vestibulocerebellum. Each part of these or each functional division of these has its own function. So the first division is called cerebrocerebellum, and it's named so because it connects with the cerebral cortex. So the two lateral regions of the cerebellar hemispheres, it receives input from the cerebral cortex via the pontine nuclei. This tract is called corticopontocerebellar pathway, and this is involved in initiating and planning voluntary and skillful movements. So this is just a draw to simplify this concept. So let's imagine this is the left cerebral cortex, and these are the pontine nuclei on the left side, and this is the right cerebellar hemisphere. So the corticopontocerebellar tract will start from the left cerebral cortex and then connects with the pontine nuclei on the left side. And then this tract crosses the midline and connects with the right cerebellar hemisphere. And that's why the cerebellar hemisphere controls the ipsilateral side of the body because it's connecting with the contralateral cerebral cortex. Since the cerebrocerebellum is involved in initiating and planning voluntary and skillful movements, lesions will result in dysmetria, which is misjudging the distance of a target leading to overshoot or undershoot. Let's say you want to grab a cup, then your hands might go beyond the cup or just before the cup. Overshoot or undershoot. This diadical kinesia means impaired ability to perform rapid alternating movements, like supination, pronation of the forearm. The spinocerebellum consists of the vermis, and the paravermis, and it's called spinocerebellum because it's connecting with the spinal cord. It receives proprioceptive input from the dorsal columns of the spinal cord, the trigeminal nerve, as well as visual and auditory input. The spinocerebellum is important for maintaining balance, gait, and posture. So you can imagine that lesion will result in ataxia, which is unsteady gait. This ataxia is motor in type, 
which means even with the eye open, the patient will still suffer from ataxia. And finally, the vestibulo cerebellum, which consists of the floccular nodular lobe. This receives vestibular input from the semicircular canals and the vestibular nuclei. It also receives visual input from the visual cortex. This is important for balance and eye movement. So lesion in the vestibular cerebellum will result in impaired balance and nystagmus. And nystagmus means rapid and controlled eye movements. The cerebellar cortex is made up of three layers. The inner layer is made of granule cells and is called the granular layer. The middle layer is composed of what's called Purkinje cells, so it's called Purkinje cell layer, and this is located again in the middle. And then the outer layer is made of the axons of the granule cells, which are the inner cell layer, and the dendrites of the Purkinje cells, which are the middle cell layer. This image here shows the inner layer, which is the granular layer, composed of granule cells, the middle layer composed of Purkinje cells, and then the molecular layer, which is the outermost layer, composed of the dendrites of the Purkinje cells and the axons of the cells of the inner layer or the granule cells. The cerebellum has three peduncles, the superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles. The superior cerebellar peduncle is mainly efferent, so it's carrying fibers from the cerebellum towards other structures. And since the cerebellum is controlling the epsilateral side of the body, these structures are going to be on the opposite side. So these structures include the contralateral thalamus in a tract called cerebellothalamocortical and the contralateral red nucleus. It also has some afferent, but more importantly, what we need to remember, it's mainly efferent, and it's the only peduncle that carries efferent fibers. Another important point is that the superior cerebellar peduncle decussates at the level of the inferior colliculus. The middle cerebellar peduncle is only afferent, and it's mainly composed of the cortical ponto cerebellar tract. These are the fibers that's coming from the cerebral cortex, runs to the ipsilateral pontine nuclei, and then goes to the contralateral cerebellum. The inferior cerebellar peduncle is as well only afferent. The afferents includes fibers like the spinal cerebellar tract, the olivo cerebellar tract, and the vestibulo cerebellar tracts. The cerebellum has four deep nuclei. These are called the deep cerebellar nuclei. These are responsible for most of the output from the cerebellum. This includes the dentate nucleus, emboliform, globose, and vestigial. The largest and the most important is the dentate nucleus. These nuclei receive gaminergic or inhibitory input from the Purkinje cells. They also receive excitatory input from the mossy and climbing fibers, as we're going to discuss in a minute. The only exception to this output role is the flocculonodular lobe that synapses directly with the vestibular nuclei to control balance and eye movements. The output from these nuclei projects through the superior cerebellar peduncle into the contralateral cerebral cortex. Sometimes they call this dentato thalamocortical tract. Now let's talk about the cerebellar circuitry. There are two types of afferent fibers that goes into the cerebellum. The first is called mossy fibers. These are the major input into the cerebellum. These fibers come from the cerebral cortex through the corticoponto cerebellar tract, the vestibular nuclei, the spinal cord, and the reticular formation. They run through the middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles, and they supply the deep cerebellar nuclei, and they end by synapsing with the granule cells. The second type of fibers are called climbing fibers, and these arise from the inferior olivary nuclei in the medulla. They run through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, and they synapse also with the deep cerebellar nuclei, and they end by synapsing with the dendrites of Purkinje cells. A good way to remember this may be to appreciate that climbing fibers, since they are climbing, they will go a little higher, so they will synapse with the higher cells, which are the Purkinje cells. And the mossy fibers, since they are not climbing, they will synapse with the lower cells, which are the granule cells. This is just a way to memorize this. Purkinje cells receive input from the climbing fibers, and also from the axons of granule cells, after the mossy fibers synapse with the granule cells. They also project into the deep cerebellar nuclei, and these are the only output from the cerebellar cortex. They are the output from the cerebellar cortex, but their output is going into the deep cerebellar nuclei. This inhibitory output enables Purkinje cells to regulate and coordinate motor movements. So, as a summary, impulses from mossy, climbing, and granule cells are excitatory. Impulses from Purkinje cells are inhibitory through GABA. If we look at this image here on the left, 
we will see the deep cerebellum nuclei as the major output from the entire cerebellum towards the premotor areas to control movements. The mossy fibers are the major input that's coming into the cerebellum. They send some excitatory impulses to the deep cerebellar nuclei, and then they go up and synapse with the granule cells. The climbing fibers as well send some, some excitation into the deep cerebellar nuclei, and then they go up and climb and synapse with the Purkinje cells. Then the granule cells send some impulses towards the Purkinje cells as well. And then the Purkinje cells, as the only output from the cerebellar cortex, project into the deep cerebellar nuclei with inhibitory impulse. In that way, the Purkinje cells will control the function of the deep cerebellar nuclei, which in turn will control the function of the motor areas. This, in turn, will result in regulation and coordination of motor movements. <music>